I have a Roomba. Well, it's not actually a Roomba. It's a shark ion robot vacuum. Much more menacing, so we named it Jaws. There's no other way to put it though. Jaws is an idiot. He has no clue what he's doing. Initially afraid of his terrifying whirs, our cats now love to watch Jaws bounce around the house, hitting every wall, chair, or table he can. He gets stuck on rugs and cords and turns on in the middle of the night for no reason. Jaws is dumb because he never learns. He just runs into things, and when he does, he points in a new direction and tries again. His entire existence is one prolonged attempt at cleaning through trial and error. Trial and error gameplay is not enjoyable for the average game player. Puzzles where the solution is to press the open door button on every stretch of free wall to find a hidden door are tedious and dull. Players want to feel like their decisions have weight to them, that they could plan and strategize, think and move. But when they fail to proceed for reasons beyond their comprehension, they get frustrated. They might ask, what's the point? Why am I even doing this? I'm not talking about dying or failing to do a task, like losing to a Dark Souls boss, but getting stuck and feeling like the only way to progress is to forcefully try every option of a puzzle to advance. That kind of gameplay is frankly tiring, and is often the point where it's time to just take a break from the game, the kind of break that can become permanent. Thus, developers have devised to make sure that you're never bored while playing their game, and most games make sure you can't get stuck for too long. Prestige tour games like The Last of Us do this quite well. Even if you're continually dying, at least you know what you're supposed to be doing at any given time. This is not the case for one of my favorite series of Flash games, the Grow series. I first played these quirky games in high school a decade ago with a close friend, and recently rediscovered their wonderful charm. For those unfamiliar, Grow games are about as simple and bare bones as you could imagine. In them, the player selects options from an array of choices, hoping to find the right combination to receive the maximum score. Honestly, they are a little tricky to explain, it's better to just show you. I put a link at the top of the description to Grow Cube, which is pretty emblematic of the genre I'm going to be discussing here. I suggest if you've never played one of these charming little Rube Goldberg machines to play around to the game and return to this video. All you gotta do is click on icons and see what happens. I'll wait. Okay, now that you're back, I'm wondering if you played just one round or if you felt compelled to try again. That feeling to want to try again is exactly what this video is about. I don't think I'd like playing life as Jaws the Shark Iron Robot Exterminator, I, I mean vacuum, but I sure do like playing Grow games. If such trial and error gameplay is usually grating on the player though, how does a game like Grow Cube, with its 10 linear choices for the player to make, manage to be enjoyable, despite its reliance on trial and error structure? Using Grow Cube as our primary example, I have 5 reasons why I think this is. So let's get started. One. The cute aesthetic and ingenious visuals. It can't be understated how important the hand-drawn art is to making Grow Cube an enjoyable experience. Every time the player makes a decision, this little cube paradise is populated by more cute things. These designs begin simple, but every time something levels up, they grow increasingly complex, revealing more layers to the player. This inspires them to keep pursuing greater levels in order to see how the game will surprise them next. And these games are nothing if not unpredictable. We'll get to why this unpredictability matters in terms of gameplay in a moment, but in terms of visuals, unpredictability keeps the player coming back. It makes the tedium of trial and error gameplay more bearable. It's like how you might play a song right after listening to it, or go watch a great movie for the second time in theaters. You probably won't do so just because the song's lyrics were good or the story was good, but because it was a visual or oral pleasure to partake in. The Grow series invokes a similar feeling in its player, motivating them to keep tinkering with its strange little world. The aesthetic fulfills the same allure of a Rube Goldberg machine, whose burgeoning curiosities keep the audience watching to find out what's next. 
The people of Girl Games easily breathe the most life into these worlds. They lack any distinguishing features, but this only adds to their personality as they express themselves with their whole bodies, kind of like a silent film actor. Like the little people below in a god game, these faceless and expressive creatures make the player care about the world they hold in their hands because they can see some bit of themselves in it. These people are plump and directly interact with the player's choices, weal or woe. They tend to amaze the player with their ingenuity, with what they build and how they use their environment to build it. They are a wild card, which adds that crucial X factor to the experience. We don't have to go far to imagine the game without them, because Grow Planet does not. And while that game does share all the features I will describe beyond this as to how Grow makes trial and error gameplay fun, it distinctly lacks chubby curiosities who multiply and run around performing unique tasks. As my wife told me when she played it for the first time, I like the other one more because it's got people. What more can I say? We like to see ourselves in the game. The aesthetic of these games is important precisely because the gameplay is not. This isn't populous black and white or spore. The player has limited options for interacting with their patrons, and it can't be said that they control these people. Instead, the player has a limited amount of decisions over the course of the game. In Grow Cube, you could argue that they only take 9 actions over an entire playthrough. Any game where the player takes only 9 actions and manages to still be fun is probably doing more than just engaging your critical thinking faculties, but your creative ones as well. In some ways, we could almost argue that Grow games are animations first and games second. But I think that such an observation misses the fact that the interaction allows for the player to feel as though these unique worlds are theirs that they made them. It puts a layer of obfuscation between audience and artist, and lets the player feel like they are molding the cube to their liking, rather than playing out someone else's fantasy. 2. Choices in Grow Games feel intuitive, but not too intuitive. In tandem with their wonderful aesthetic, Grow Games feel intuitive to play. Take Grow Cube. Once you get a grasp on your goal and the process of achieving that goal, decisions don't feel like you are mindlessly selecting between 10 different identical numbers, even though that is all you are ostensibly doing, but between different interactive options based on how you perceive the world to work. We know that plants grow over time, so it makes sense to plant them early so they have time to grow. We also know that plants need water, so we're likely to build water early on as well. And we'll need someone to tend the garden, so better toss the people in early too. Making these decisions feels good, because we're taking our ability to recognize patterns in the world and applying it to the world of the game. The great thing about Grow Games is that while the options in front of the player feel intuitive, their solutions are often unintuitive, and things interact with each other in ways that you can't expect. A good example of this is the fire in Grow Cube, which, if left unattended, will break the pot when the people try to cook with it. It makes sense that this would happen, but the player is unlikely to have seen it coming. Thus, while an individual choice might feel intuitive, the interactions between those choices morph over time in unexpected ways. This makes the trial and error gameplay feel less like random clicking and more like critical thinking, even before the player gets a grasp on how their choices interact with one another. Even if those early critical ways of making choices don't lead to immediate victory, they take the hit or miss reality of the choices and makes it feel more like the player can, on their own, figure out the puzzle through their wit and guile. Once the player is actively problem solving, they will get hooked on the puzzle. 3. Each decision in Grow is meaningful and complex. This intuitiveness would be meaningless if the decisions themselves were not meaningful. Making decisions meaningful in a turn-based puzzle game is much trickier than in an action or arcade game. Consider Flappy Bird, a different kind of trial and error game where the player only has one action they can take. Flap. Yet, it managed to capture the collective attentions of the planet, at least it felt at the time, because that decision was made in conjunction with time. Every moment you were either flapping or not flapping, and thus actually making hundreds of decisions a minute. A grow game has no such luxury. Decisions and game states are made in relation to each other, not an external clock, and thus there are incredibly few decisions to be made overall. Yet, every one of those nine decisions in Grow Cube feels meaningful because they are. 
Only one combination of choices will yield the proper result, and as the player starts mapping them out, they only grow in complexity and significance. In one game, you might max out the level of one choice early and realize that you need to place it later, but not too late. You might learn that you need to place one selection after another, like the fire with the pot, but not too long after that choice, or else the pot won't be able to cook everything it needs to. Trial and error grows its most stale when the player doesn't feel like what they are doing matters. Imagine putting coins into a slot machine looking for a jackpot, but knowing that you have put no money on the line and will get no money when the jackpot comes. That is trial and error devoid of any meaning or complexity. You put the coin in the machine, pull the lever, and wait. In Grow, the player can spend minutes contemplating the next move because they quickly learn that while the act of making choices is simple, the consequences of those choices are anything but. 4. Each round of gameplay plays out differently. Any wrong choice in a grow game results in failure, but the player won't know if it does until they finish the run themselves and find out. So as they experiment, they need to take risks. Make sure not to repeat the same mistakes as last time. This may be the most beautiful thing about a grow game, the fact that the ideal player never repeats the same order of choices twice. Thus, every time they play the game, they get a different result. Different, of course, does not always mean better, but it does mean they are slowly revealing new aspects of the game world, experiencing change with each decision. This is crucial for making its rote, trial and error gameplay enjoyable. Imagine doing something that might be considered similarly difficult and needing significant practice, like shooting free throws in basketball. Every time you toss the ball up, it bounces off the rim in a new way. You know you were off center or perhaps put too much strength behind the shot and adjust for the next shot. But if you keep making the same mistake, like hitting the left rim, you are more likely to grow tired of the monotony of experiencing the same thing over and over. By keeping the end state of each playthrough varied, grow games keep the player engaged long enough for them to reach a satisfying conclusion. Beyond this, grow games are also veritable troves of secret interactions. Yes, the player can pursue the ideal maximum level victory they are meant to strive after, but some decisions change the world in unexpected ways, rewarding the player for their trial and error without giving them success. For instance, in Grow Cube, if one plants the fire early and the bowl a little later, the fire will become an elemental and commandeer this tower. This kind of hidden interaction ensures that the game continues to reward the player on their way to finding the solution and helps lessen the sting of the error part of the gameplay, which leads us to our final point. 5. The player constantly learns new information that pushes them toward the right solution. In conjunction with the above point, the patient and attentive player is always learning as they play grow. When one thing goes wrong or doesn't level appropriately, they know that they have to change their ways, regroup, and try again. If one choice gets maxed out early, they know they can delay making that decision for a while. If one doesn't make it far enough, they know they need to push it back. Every time they experience something new, they are taking in new information to use toward a solution, rewarding the player for keeping an active mind instead of mindlessly clicking their way through another attempt. This matters for the game's trial and error gameplay because the fine line between play and work is defined by whether the player is having fun, and randomly clicking on squares is not fun for long, but learning, changing, growing as they play is fun. These games engage the player's curiosity because they're trying to map out its internal systems with every choice they make. The more the player stops to carefully consider the next move, the more they are an active component of this ridiculously simple game. In this way, grow games are more intuitive than other kinds of puzzles that initially seem to be similarly trial and error. A Rubik's Cube, for example, can't really be solved by mindlessly spinning its cubes. And similarly, the grow games would take a long time to beat if the player was only clicking randomly. There are 10 factorial, or 3.6 million paths the player can take in grow cube. Someone in the comments can correct me if I'm wrong. If you attempted to reach every end state with consecutive one minute runs, that would only take around seven years. A Rubik's cube is likewise pretty damn difficult to solve without some amount of outside help. But in grow cube, a similarly complex game, they can solve it all by their lonesome. 
And that is because each pursuit toward the goal leaves some new knowledge with the player, places them one more stair on the ladder to success. Ultimately, that's what we want to receive from trial and error gameplay, the feeling of success at our own efforts, ingenuity, and persistence. That's what makes this style of gameplay fun. Trial and error thinking is not unique to grow games or to puzzle games. You can see it in Dark Souls bosses, Zelda dungeons, and Doom secrets, all of which have been held up as amazing examples of interactive art. What Grow does is strip away all the pomp and fanfare from the process, distilling this kind of play into its essence and remaining enjoyable on the other end.